Hello, everyone, and welcome to the final installment in our year-long series on the intersection between the digital economy and national security. I am Abraham Newman, and I am the director of the Mortara Center uh, for International Studies here at Georgetown University. And uh, along with Kate McNamara, who is my co-conspirator or collaborator, um, we've been uh, organizing this, the desk um, uh, workshops. This is the Digital Economy and Security Collaborative. So today's talk is going to be about digital uh, standards, and it is the final in the series. Um, if you're interested in the series, you can go to our YouTube channel, which has uh, all of the previous speakers, and, and you can watch the different sessions on AI, cybersecurity, uh, a whole host of really important and interesting topics. Before I introduce our speakers for today, I just want to acknowledge uh, that Georgetown's success today uh, is in part the product of the sale of enslaved uh, labor. And you can find out more about Georgetown's history with slavery at slavery.georgetown.edu. Uh, with that, I would love to welcome our two speakers, uh, Laura Donardis, who is a professor at American University, and Michael Murphy, who is a professor uh, at the University of South Carolina. Uh, we put their full bios in the chat, and so you can learn more about each speaker and their research there, but they're both um, really world-renowned experts on this topic of digital standards, and I am thrilled uh, to have them in this conversation today. Uh, so uh, we flipped a coin. No, we didn't flip a coin, but we, uh, we decided that uh, uh, Professor Denardis would go first. Uh, she's going to make some initial remarks, and then I'll talk. turn it over to Michael. Uh, and then we'll open it up for conversation. Um, as has happened in the past, uh, we ask that you put your questions in the Q&A. And after uh, both talks are over, I will kind of filter those uh, questions to the speakers. OK, so with that, um, thanks again, Laura and Michael, for joining. And I turn it over to Laura. Well, thank you very much. And hi, everyone. I'm really pleased to be here today to discuss digital standards as a proxy for political power. Now the background context for my brief remarks is that the digital and the physical are no longer distinct spheres. The internet is in everything from critical infrastructure to home systems to even inside of the and on the human body. And this means that everything from human safety to the economy to national security now depend on the security of digital infrastructure. What's so interesting about this, though, is that 99% of this digital infrastructure is not at all visible in the same way that content and applications are. And how these systems are governed um, is also somewhat behind the scenes, even while the stakes for humanity are rising. Now, digital standards are part of uh, what I would call internet governance. And um, I would suggest that conflicts over internet governance, often inside the black box of technology, are the new global spaces where um, human rights are unfolding and where economic power is unfolding. Yet the term internet governance is also an oxymoron in many ways because it's not merely about governments. And it's also not one thing. It's many overlapping functions that are necessary to keep the internet operational and then the enactment of public policy around these infrastructures. That definitely includes the administration of the domain name system and management of IP addresses and, and names. Um, it includes private contractual agreements between network operators that come together to give us the global digital system and form the global internet. It includes cybersecurity governance. It includes, um, of course, the policy making role of private intermediaries that uh, determine everything from privacy to speech rights to um, even mediating uh, disinformation. And across all of these issue areas, governments are making laws about cybercrime, intellectual property, antitrust, data localization, the protection of children, um, in just a host, a host of issues. And at the same time, they are also co-opting these systems for surveillance, for censorship, and to enact different kinds of foreign policy. We certainly see that in the present moment with Russian attacks on critical infrastructure in Ukraine or China's use of the DNS for censorship as some examples. Digital standards, 
a major part of this ecosystem. It's also arguably the most abstract and complex part, but even these are steeped in geopolitical conflict. Now, I wanted to, to just stop for a moment and, and ask the question, well, what are digital standards we're talking about? about exactly what are we talking about here? Well, in the same way that humans have agreed upon protocols for how to greet each other, uh, whether you, you bow or shake hands or kiss each other on each side of the cheek, or if you're in Geneva, you do it on three sides of the three, three times. These are protocols for humans. We know how to address an envelope and reach a destination. We know how to speak to each other with common grammar and language. So too it is with digital devices. So I know the eyes are glazing over. I intentionally did this on the slide. But I, I, it's important to say that, um, say what these are, they're agreed upon rules that enable global interoperability and therefore enable access to knowledge and communication. They dictate how to encode any kind of information in the world into zeros and ones. They dictate how to compress information like a song so that we can send it over a network or stream it and listen to it at a party. They translate human readable domain names into IP addresses and they authenticate, they encrypt, they provide the trust system so that the political system and, the, and all systems of society can depend upon this infrastructure. So I put these random examples just off the top of my head of some, um, some digital standards. And as you can see, it's an acronym stew of, um, of words. And I won't tell you what all of these stand for, but also, the standard setting organizations are, uh, a num are acronyms as well, like the Internet Engineering Task Force, the IETF, the World Wide Web Consortium, W3C. So this is a very, um, in some ways, it's very visible to me, but I think to many people who use the Internet, this is behind the scenes in a way that something like social media is behind the scenes. So there's not one standard that keeps the digital system working. There are many, many standards and there are powerful institutions that are responsible for um, designing those and therefore shaping them based on values and human rights considerations. Now, I wanted to go from that into just a, a conceptual framework. Uh, Professor Newman asked to put some themes out there. And uh, so one theme, and this is actually the conceptual framework that underlies all of my work and um, all of the books that I've written. And that's that arrangements of technical architecture are also arrangements of power that determine individual rights, that determine the, uh, the political sphere, that determine um, how the digital economy flows and is secured around the world. I've specialized in emerging technologies, uh, I have a book on um, next generation internet protocols. I've got work on cybersecurity architecture. Um, my most recent book was on the internet of things. I just wrote a paper on quantum networks and I'm uh, launching um, an anticipatory governance project around the interplanetary internet. And every single one of these has digital ethics dimensions and each one of them is also in, in a way in, in, in the background, in the background. So it's the same thing, just zeroing in on just one of those areas, and that's um, digital standards, which I'll call protocols for the purposes of this slide. How do these affect human beings? Well, accessibility standards empower those with hearing or sight impairments. They shape privacy in speech rights and global access to knowledge. The degree of openness and intellectual property rights affect economic competition and the freedom to innovate. And encryption standards especially are political with battles over key strength and even export restrictions mediating values of law enforcement and intelligence gathering versus individual privacy and economic security. So you can see how they're mediating points of control that have to balance or consider different kinds of values that are often in tension in this area. Now it's helpful to, do, to discuss a few more specific examples. Uh, I'll, I'll um, briefly mention a few and maybe zero in on quantum, uh, in quantum encryption standards. Um, and I was debating about which one to discuss uh, in more detail. I think I'll choose that one. But uh, certainly one example is geopolitical concern over, as it was called, the Chinese trying to reinvent the internet 
in their effort um, to propose, at least vaguely, a new replacement for the internet protocol, which is a core architecture of the internet. Now, this was met with uh, great alarm uh, by the internet's technical community, by private industry, and by the West. And that is a geopolitical saga, just that issue in and of itself. Uh, 5G geopolitical clashes, uh, most people are more familiar with that one. And I think I'll leave it to my colleague, Professor Murphy, to dig into that. Um, one of the most consequential areas is in IoT, digital standards. And this is important because the internet, and this, I wanna really emphasize this as a, as a theme, the internet is no longer a communication network. It's no longer just a communication network. It is a control system in which more things than people are connected. This was the subject of um, my book, The Internet and Everything, Freedom and Security in a World with No Off Switch. So the internet is, is inside of billions of objects raising questions about what it means to be human in that environment. Um, it raises unprecedented privacy concerns, but also it largely lacks um, adequate security. Think about one of the most significant and largest attacks in internet history, the Mirai botnet, that was carried out by hijacking IoT devices and carrying out uh, distributed denial of service attacks on major media sites. You probably remember that one. So the security of everything, including human security, it depends on the security of these connected cyber physical objects. Now, um, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll mention quantum. Allow me to flag um, a less discussed standards issue, but one that is of great concern in standards communities. There's tremendous global investment by governments and by private um, entrepreneurs and companies in quantum technology. So that just like the internet is not one thing, quantum is also not one thing. It includes quantum sensing, quantum computing, quantum communications. There's, there's quite a lot there. But digital technologies are based on discrete zeros and ones. And I often teach my students how to encode things like um, their name in zeros and ones just to demystify it. I mean, anyone can learn about that, but it's all based on discrete discrete zeros and ones. In contrast, and at a more atomic level of photons and electrons, quantum approaches use atomic objects to represent and process, instead of bits now, qubits, which are quantum bits, which can observationally take on a value of either zero or one at a given time because of a quantum mechanics property of superposition. They also can correlate to each other. They can't influence each other, kind of like teleportation, but they actually correlate and connect to each other over long distances because of the quantum mechanics principle of entanglement. What on earth does this mean for the future of humanity? This world is completely counter to human perception and observation, but it does predict exponentially more processing power, speed, and accuracy. So this can revolutionize things that are very important to human beings like medicine, like roles of artificial intelligence in how we structure our society and really anything that is uh, computationally intensive. However, it's also a credible threat to how the internet infrastructure currently works. And um, if I may suggest this, I don't think it's that controversial. Maybe Professor Murphy will agree with me, but when do tech technical standards communities ever agree on anything? They're often competing with each other, but on this point, they do agree that quantum computing foreshadows serious cyber security problems. I selected a few quotes on here to, to, that you, you could read for yourself. One is from the Internet Engineering Task Force. Uh, one is from NIST. Um, let me read that one. If large scale quantum computers are ever built, they will be able to uh, break many of the public key crypto systems currently in use. Um, I can't actually see that quote because I have things in front of it, on, but I hope I read that accurately. Basically, they're saying that um, some entrenched cryptographic approaches are more vulnerable than others as well, if you read some of these other quotes. And um, I wanna just pause and emphasize what this means. It turns out that some of the most vulnerable standards and algorithms 
are the ones that are used in public key cryptography. So you might say, oh, okay, well, privacy is at risk. My ability to uh, text Professor Newman, someone might that might be broken. And even though it can't be read now, if we use a very strong encryption platform, it can be in the future. It's not just about that. Public key cryptography is the system upon which every trust system that's of importance that keeps the digital infrastructure operating is based. That includes um, authenticating financial transactions, authenticating human identity. How, it's how VPNs work. Many of you probably use, you should use a VPN, um, securing domain name system queries, um, even controlling access to Bitcoin. So you can see that this is an incredibly important area it's the way that digital standards are, it's one other way that digital standards are connected to human security and to um, every civil uh, liberty that you can imagine for people as well as national security. Um, I just have this slide with some logos on it. In, in case someone is interested, I'd be happy to send you my paper on this, but there are many different conversations happening and they are, they're concentrating in really two areas. One is shoring up the existing infrastructure of digital systems to try to withstand these um, anticipatory governance brute force attacks that could be coming with quantum computing. And a, another set of uh, approaches is trying to overlay quantum technologies on the existing digital infrastructure in order to, uh, to shore that up and to make everything more secure. So these efforts are nascent, they're future looking, they seem to be forming multiple competing standards organizations doing work in the same area, which is probably appropriate at this point of early development. Um, it's very interesting to look at the patents that are being fire, uh, filed by different companies. Um, it's an exciting area, uh, but this issue of protecting existing infrastructure from anticipated attack, it's an important one, it's a clear and present danger. And it's one very well recognized by China, by the European Union, the US and beyond. So what I hope I have done here is to raise some themes. That was what, uh, what Kate and Abe asked me to do. So um, if I've raised some th themes in these brief remarks, I, I hope that's true. Certainly the politicization and the co-opting of standards. Uh, I've talked a little bit about technical design entanglements with national security. Um, another theme is how much of this important governance work is being carried out by the private sector. So we have the digital mediation of the public sphere, and we have the privatization of conditions of human rights within that sphere, and that's a very, very notable theme. Where does that leave governments? Where does that leave civil society? And you know, we often call this multi-stakeholder governance, but it's really private sector-led multi-stakeholder governance. Uh, another theme is the um, disconnect between a borderless infrastructure that crosses borders in many, many different ways that are not even inherently consistent. So you could have a domain name registered in a certain place, the DNS server in another place, public key cryptography could be handled by an institution in another country. Uh, you could just, even a, a, an exchange of information in one country, um, especially on some continents, it could go through another continent and then come back. So this is not at all uh, connected to national borders, uh, which makes it very interesting and very challenging. And then of course, how constant technological change prompts new digital ethics, ethics uh, dilemmas. So thank you very much for letting me share this. And <clears throat> I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay, I am without further ado, I'm going to send it over to Michael, who is going to share his screen. And so I have. Well, I do thank you so much for having me here. And I must say, uh, Laura, that this is a very tough act to follow. But in terms of the themes that I will be approaching in my discussion on, as you mentioned earlier, that no one understands digital standards and that this makes for bad policy. My focus is primarily going to be on the economic aspects of it, and specifically the misconceptions that we have regarding technology standards and how these misconceptions have led to both poorly implemented policy as well as poor practices by many firms. 
So Laura provided helpfully uh, avoided my first slide, which I was able to remove concerning what exactly are standards. The basic defined protocols on which other products, goods, and services can be developed. Um, now, naturally, as being platforms, this means that they have to necessarily be open. And we will be getting into that when we talk about the value and the significance of many of these different misconceptions. So one of the major issues that I would like to discuss first is the myth of country level control. So much of the discussion regarding technology standards discusses American standards or in the past Japanese standards or European standards and certainly today the question of Chinese standards. The problem with this is that while in the past it was certainly true, I give the example here as Laura had mentioned about the frequency of acronyms. Here we have PAL, CCAM, and NTC. These were analog uh, television, color television standards in the 1970s and 80s, specifically German, French, and American. And so the issue was naturally being developed by companies completely within a single country and supported by different national governments did in fact make these national level standards. And therefore it really was the French versus the Americans. Indeed, CCAM, CCAM, the French acronym was said to stand for something exceedingly contrary to the American method, just because it was supposed to poke the Americans in the eye, uh, to which the French said NTSC, the American one is never twice same color. So saying that it was a poor standard. But the point about country level control today is that standards are exceedingly complex. Laura had alluded to some of the great challenges involved in, quant in uh, developing new standards in the quantum space. No single country is developing all of the protocols for these newly emergent standards. And indeed, as we've moved in telecommunications, these standards which underlie our internet and especially our mobile internet, as we've moved from 1G to 2G to 3, by 3G, there was an understanding that the world would be better off having a single standard. So they got three at 3G. So they tried again with 4G, managed to get it down to two, and now with, in the fifth generation, we've managed to get it down essentially to a single global standard. But it is not a Chinese standard, nor is it American or European, Japanese or Korean, as there are many different contributors from these different global state company and individual memberships. The second myth is regarding and related to the question of company control. Much of there is debate today is about will Huawei control the internet? And the problem with this understanding is that by definition, a globally accepted uh, standard developed in these consortia must adhere to the RAND or in Europe, FRAND principle, fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory. And what does that mean? Reasonable means that the licensing rates for any embedded essential intellectual property these patents must be licensed at a reasonable rate, whatever that may mean. Non-discriminatory means that you cannot forbid any would-be adopter from choosing to adopt and then utilize these patents. Huawei cannot prevent an American company from using its 5G patents as part of developing a 5G compatible technology. Similarly, American firms cannot prevent Huawei from using their patents and technology when Huawei produces a 5G compatible technology or product. So there is no single company which is able to control it because their patents must be issued in accordance with the RAND principle. The problem that lies within the RAND principle is the steadfast refusal to set a standard of standards. So there has been a movement, including by the Biden administration, to try to define what is a appropriate standard for reasonableness in licensing fees. But as many digital technologies companies today increasingly rely on licensing revenues, as opposed to relying on product sales, there's a strong resistance to defining what constitutes reasonableness. Interestingly, in China, there's a strong favor of pursuing a common definition for reasonableness, which, sets, which would set very, very low rates for licensing of patents. The idea being to systematically devalue intellectual property and increase the value inherent in the goods or services built using said property. And then the final myth, and this is the one you'll hear the most in uh, Congress or in other policy debates, 
is the equivalence of a standard with a product. Quantum computing is a concept. It's not a product as such. 5G is not a product. It is a platform on which mobile phones and routers and distributors and base stations will be built. These are the products. One of the most common examples of standards that I use in my class is the USB. USB is not a product. It's a protocol for interfacing between hardware devices, which then enables different devices, whether memory sticks, power, et cetera, to interface with one another. And so naturally, you cannot say that I own a standard unless it is a de facto one. For example, Microsoft's de facto standard for Windows or for its office software suite. But that's not quite the standards we're discussing today. The results of these misconceptions over time have been many different attempts at national level standards development policies from groups such as ETSI, the European Technology Standards Institute, Japan Industrial Standards Committee, and most recently, and seen as great alarm, the China Standards 2035 proposal. The argument here with these national level policies is that by promoting creation of a new standard, they will own the future. This would be true if the standard was wholly indigenous, but even China Standards 2035, the stated goal is the increase of Chinese properties, Chinese intellectual properties in global standards, not the creation of wholly unique or differentiated Chinese laws. At least that's the stated policy. However, when it comes to security protocols, that's different. They're, they, they would like very much to set national standards for that. A similar difficulty arises in the China or Huawei versus United States difficulty. Uh, the joke that I always tell my students is that Huawei laughs all the way to the bank because even though Huawei products are banned in the United States and cannot be sold here, base stations cannot be constructed, any 5G base station is still paying licensing fees to Huawei because of the standards essential intellectual properties that they have contributed to it. And similarly, as much as Huawei may want to be technology independent, even if they develop their own semiconductors, they still have to pay Qualcomm, American and Korean and Japanese and European firms for the intellectual property in the platform of 5G. There's also significant conflict between and among firms over the question of who owns a standard. And this gets to that question of reasonableness. Interestingly, Apple, for as much intellectual property as they own, is strongly in favor of a reasonableness standard that would make standards essential intellectual properties much more, much less expensive. Whereas Qualcomm favors having no rules for this to be able to set these rates as they will. And finally, so that there'll be good time for question and answer, I would like to note that one of the greatest results of these misconceptions is the desire to nationalize standardization, which will result in a reduced overall pace of innovation and technology development or balkanization of technologies. I have friends who are in uh, working with 3GPP, for example, the 3G uh, uh, partnership that develops next generation mobile. They are this year finally going to begin having in-person meetings, working group discussions, not over Zoom. The fear is that many representatives from say China will not be able to get visas to come to the United States, or if a meeting is held in China that American delegates would not be able to get visas to attend. And as Laura had mentioned, participation is power in these groups. If you are unable to be there, you are unable to make the case for your technology, make the case for your protocol. So this balkanization will result in fewer people being able to attend, greater power concerns, and unfortunately then a slower pace of new technology development. So hopefully at uh, future meetings, we'll be able to discuss some of these issues in greater detail. But as a general introduction, I think we need to educate not only ourselves and our business people, but especially our government authorities in these, in what are standards and what does it mean? Thank you. Great. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Michael and Laura, for these great comments. Um, before I kick off uh, a few questions, I wanted to remind listeners that if you put uh, questions in the chat, then I will, you know, filter them to our guests as they come up. Um, so I 
I see, which I love, a debate forming uh, between Laura and Michael, which is about, is there power in the standards? Do I need to own these things? Uh, where, where are the inflection points of where that power might rest? And, um, you know, I took Laura's uh, comments to say, yes, we need, you know, the content of these standards is really important and it can affect or shape, you know, how things play out. Where I felt like Michael's um, introduction was more about the interoperability that standards are neutral in their, uh, in their use and platform. And that I think is a great debate. And so I'd like to press on people, both of you, to, to, to think about that um, and, and maybe debate each other a little bit. The second thing is that um, I want to raise the question of where is this fight happening now? Because I think in the early internet days, there were a set of expert bodies, uh, these quasi private, you know, uh, Laura put up a lot of the acronyms of these organizations. But increasingly, I think we see firms uh, trying to play a really dominant role in, in sometimes what, what, what you guys were calling standards, but also sometimes in the, the applications that are being used around those standards. So I'm thinking right now of the recent Apple privacy uh, rollout where they changed their operating system. You know, that's, in, for my mind, that's a very consequential uh, set of standards that have been released into our, you know, communication infrastructure, but they weren't really created at a, you know, the, you know, quasi private um, engineering societies. And so kind of, you know, th there's that. And then, as Laura mentioned, there's also government efforts to shape these standards. And so are, was there a heyday where these quasi private bodies really ran the roost and that's, that's now disappearing? Or do you think that, that really we're still in that world? So those are my two kind of first questions that I'll put out there on the table. So uh, Laura, would you, care to, would you care to go first on the question of standards and power? Um, I'd be happy to do that. And I, I think that's a great topic to queue up. And I think it's also related to uh, Kate's comment that I read in the chat. Uh, but let me try to break it down into four areas. So there is, um, there's political power in the way that the institution is structured itself, just like there is in other domains of, um, you know, that involve institutions. Uh, so some institutions do not allow people to participate. Some institutions are open to participation, but then they're often dominated by the private sector and in some cases, a lobbying organizations. In some cases, you're, you're not even allowed to get into the room. So I, I went to Geneva one time to, to I, I won't get into the story, but some people, you know, it's difficult. You have to have a side event sometimes because only governments are allowed in some organizations. That is very inappropriate for the way that this is, um, you know, the role of the private sector and, it, and it's created problems in the past because you have to have something that actually works in products, right? There's a disconnect between the standard and whether it works in a product. But I would say that the whole institutional dimension of this is a point of um, connection with the international uh, system. So pro that includes the processes, that includes participation, that includes openness. And then, then I would break the other three areas into three. One is the development, the design of standards. The next is the implementation of them. And the next is the use of them, because there are international power struggles in each of those areas. So one of them is design. And you know, I've written about this a lot. Um, and, and by the way, the, so sta my standards work is my early work. And I wrote my doctoral dissertation on the next generation internet. And so I've, I've been looking at this over a long period of time. Um, I'm more of a, uh, you know, a technology and society scholar now writ large. But I've been looking at this and tracing it over a long period of time, and I really still believe that much of the power exists in the design. So look, you, you could look at any example of something related to encryption and battles over how strong the encry encryption can be. Or do you embed something like a physical address into, in, into uh, an IP address? 
that the answer to both of those questions determines um, human privacy. So how the, you know the values coming into that uh, shape it, but also uh, procedural issues, due process, um, open participation. The next area, now I guess I'm in the third area, it is in uh, implementation of the standards. So this is an area that involves a lot of um, economic power uh, at an international level, as especially around intellectual property rights and standards-based patents. This is uh, the reason that we have the internet that we have now is because of open standards that are not restricted in their use. And that was um, for, for those that are much younger than I am, I, I just want to tell you that at one point, we couldn't send an email to each other if we used different products made by different people. And that's not that long ago. The reason we can do that is because open standard of open standards that are uh, not encumbered by um, patents in the same way as uh, other uh, parts of industry, and that can actually be read. So if you believe that the design embeds international politics, then you have to look at the implementation and say, well, if, if that's the case, especially in democracies, we should be able to read the standard and look at it and examine it. And um, that's not always the case, but when we can, that way we have an opportunity to actually look and um, have a more democratic environment. Like what are the values that are embedded? And then finally the use, um, if the standards are based on openness, not encumbered by patents, um, it results in multiple competing platforms. And uh, also in the use, you know, governments have all kinds of obvious roles, procurement policies, regulations. Um, so I, I would say just, you know, off the top of my head, those are the, and in thinking about this for a long time, there are about four areas and I, I, I can think of a couple more, but I'll leave it there. This is a great point and a great question and a great place to start. And um, I think that uh, characterizing Laura and my perspectives as a debate may be, um, perhaps the fault is on me for uh, lack of clarity in the way I discussed the misconceptions and the myths regarding standards. It is certainly not that power plays no role. It's that the standard as a whole cannot be treated as a monolith, as a unitary block, which can be controlled or used one way or the other. As well as technological power, and I'll get into this in a second, at the design stage, at the protocol drafting stage. Companies, and by extension, in groups like the ITU, which are member nation only, government-based, fight tooth and nail to have their preferred protocols be written into the standard. And this matters because if it is your preferred protocols, it is therefore your intellectual property, which will be mandatory licensed as part of developing standards compatible products. So it's a guaranteed source of revenue for as long as that standard endures. And standards can be very sticky. Look at your keyboard, you're using a QWERTY keyboard. And we all know the somewhat mythologized, but the story of why we use QWERTY as opposed to standard layout. Standards have a way of sticking. So there's strong interest in getting your technology embedded at the protocol stage. Similarly, then, there's the technological power aspect. A company which controls, i.e. drafted the protocols and wrote, controls the intellectual property for that particular aspect of a standard will have a deeper understanding and advance in the research and development of new technologies built on that existing protocol, giving them a further advantage in subsequent generations of standards. The major concern, therefore, from different governments is not do I control 5G, but how do I build policies to encourage my firms and my universities and my labs to take a very strategic and sustained look at the importance of standardization and therefore encourage them to participate, to contribute, and therefore to gain power in these organizations. Um, we had a, heart, a uh, opinion piece in the Harvard Business Review about six years ago saying the United States does this very poorly in comparison with Japan, the European Union, and China. There's a very strong strategy towards saying we want to contribute and encourage our firms to contribute actively to standards, and we will provide funding specific to the development of standards-relevant protocols from the technologies developed in our firms. 
So there is absolutely a power dimension. The problem is that if we think of standards as a monolithic block, which can be controlled from one to another, we then miss where policies can actually be effectively targeted. Great. Um, so <clears throat> we have a, a series of questions that have come up in the chat. Um, one of them is about the issue of uh, cybersecurity and if there is a, kind of an optimistic role for uh, standards to play. And I would just give a shout out back to Gerda Faulkner from Vienna because I haven't seen her for many, many years, but I'm wishing her well. Um, and so that's, I think, one set of questions about, um, you know, is there an optimistic, but also a pessimistic scenario of where cybersecurity could go in terms of standards? Uh, a second, which is a big set of questions as well, is about China and standards. And um, what are the different ways? It, it, you know, do you can you assess a Chinese strategy uh, in digital standards? You, you hear very competing things. You know, things about oh, we're going to break up the internet. Oh, we're going to use this for surveillance. You know, global surveillance repression. Oh, we're going to you know. So, what is your kind of take on the role that China is playing? Uh, and then the third is, you know, um, some of the conversation about standards is often centered from a business perspective that we want common standards for efficiency. But um, aren't there also cases where governments will try to prevent standards or you know, create national standards because they have other priorities? And so several of the questions are around you know, whether it's about legibility of their populations, whether it's about control of, of firms, of the private sector. So the, there's, of course, there's like the old story about train tracks in Europe where none of them you know, could run on the same train tracks because of military concerns. They didn't want the trains to go from France to Germany. You know, those kinds of stories. So where do you see that going in the digital space in the next uh, you know, 10 to 15 years? And maybe we'll start with Michael just because we started with Laura last time. Certainly, and I do apologize for the wind-induced uh, wind static that you may be experiencing due to the fact that I had to do this outside. I would actually start with the China question. And so can we discern a Chinese strategy? The answer is yes, they published it in China Standards 2035. But one thing we also have to remember as good political scientists is that government, it's not the state it, it's the state they. There are many different ministries within the Chinese government. There are many different interests regarding technology standardization. And some of these are, at Abe, as you had mentioned, they are uh, questions of wanting a wholly unique set of Chinese standards for protectionist purposes, not for efficiency, but for protection. But there are also interests in other ministries in the efficiency aspect. Many of China's, in fact, all of China's leading technology firms, especially digital technology, not the service providers so much, but at least in terms of hardware, they are export-oriented firms. For them, they have fought vigorously to avoid unique Chinese standards for a significant period of time, mostly because they know unique standards in China would require them to tool production lines for two, two different systems, which would be a waste. They would lose some of the economies of scale they gain from producing for a single common global standard. But other ministries have said that China needs to have its own unique standards. The other aspect we have to remember in this is that once a standard becomes established as a global or international standard, under World Trade Organization rules, it is supposed to be mandatory. There are exceptions, of course, but the principle is that a government cannot create an exclusive national standard if there is already an existing international one. Hence the strong desire for your company's protocols to be part of the global standard because it is then globally binding. So that speaks a little bit to the Chinese aspect. To the security aspect, you can see it going in both directions. And you can also see companies not just in the US or in China, but worldwide seeing different aspects of security standards as being either in or against their own interests. The recent debate over why, is, uh, why was Meta's or Facebook stock declining because a shift in security and privacy protocols was bad for their business. So we have two American firms that vigorously disagree on what should be the standard for security and privacy. So what I would say is there should be a vigorous technology debate 
and there should be a vigorous fight over this because ostensibly in standards it should be let the best standard win but then that brings in power and economic base as well but hopefully there will be competition that yields a publicly beneficial outcome in, in security Great, thank you very much. Yeah, three three questions: cybersecurity, China, and fragmentation. On cybersecurity, uh, the first thing I would say is that cybersecurity is the great human rights issue of our time. It's necessary for democracy. It's necessary for the economy, and it's necessary for society. And increasingly, it's necessary for the right to live. When you think about the internet embedded in medical devices, cars, and everything around us at all times. And standards are already embedded in cybersecurity. There would be no cybersecurity without the standards that shape that from IPsec to DNSSEC to SSL to HTTPS. So it, it's already embedded in there. In fact, the Facebook outage was related to BGP, that's Border Gateway Protocol and uh, DNS. So I would say that it's already embedded in there. And because it is, um, it's also um, an opportunity to shape how cybersecurity will uh, move forward in the future. And I gave the quantum example before, and that's definitely one arena. On the issue of China, uh, there's always been a tension going back a very, very long way between uh, models of uh, standards governance and also uh, technology governance writ large that it would be called the multi-stakeholder governance model versus cyber sovereignty models, which have a much, much stronger role for the state. You can imagine and understand that China falls in that latter camp. Um, um, I, I wrote a paper about you know, so-called multi-stakeholder governance in um, a, a journal called International Theory. And it, I, I used to play on um, uh, like multilateralism. Um, it's, 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 on, it's an anatomy of an inchoate global institution. Multi-stakeholderism is the name of the paper. And it's, um, it's really a private sector led thing. China is completely opposed to that. They want a cyber sovereignty model. And you can see that in um, a lot of uh, debates and uh, conflicts in this area. Uh, it's not just for control and it's not just for protection, but it's also because the, uh, a lot of the Chinese companies are later entrants and it's a way to prioritize indigenous companies and many other countries are doing that as well. So there are economic models behind what seems uh, like a political decision and, and a political model as ever. Um, on the issue of fragmentation, I think that's a really interesting topic to bring up and uh, thank you for doing it. Um, we want common standards for certain things, but in other areas, and this is a controversial statement, fragmentation is actually desirable. Do we want a toaster connected to a nuclear reactor? We definitely do not. So in um, certain industries, having that openness interoperability and the ability to bring uh, desirable technologies into emerging markets. Interoperability is the key to that. In other areas, fragmentation it may not be bad for some of the human rights issues that I described earlier. Thank you. Those are, it was a great set of comments. I'm, it was reminding me there was this news story just the other day of um, a Nordic telecom operator who is leaving uh, Myanmar uh, because it, it's, you know, because of human rights issues, but it's basically selling its operation to a company that's aligned with the government. And so, you know, there's all these questions of data access and all, you know, the, the internet traffic, all, all the different things that will then be exposed. And it just, it was a reminder to me of kind of the transnational nature of private economic networks are so integrally linked to um, the way governments control their populations and what we what we allow governments to do. Um, I wanted to uh, follow up on this question about the multi-stakeholder model and its challenge uh, in the Western countries. So uh, one of the things that I think, um, you know, when the internet began and internet governance began, the governments and the multi-stakeholders, the private actors in, in the West were very much aligned in what their interests were, which were to open markets, to create an interoperability, those kinds of things. Um, but there are several trends right now. So um, Michael mentioned you know, the fights between Facebook and Apple. The, the, the firms don't always agree on what should be happening. 
Um, but also there are, I think, different incentives between the firms and the governments in the West. So you saw this with the disinformation uh, issues, the algorithms that promote polarization and um, extremism. There, you know, the question is, do, are the multi-stakeholders a good, um, you know, uh, what's the right word? Uh, should we be trusting them to come up with the standards that are going to produce good outcomes for democracies as well? Um, so I think Laura's comment was, well, of course, the, the authoritarian governments aren't so interested in these multi-stakeholder models, but is there a moment now that we're seeing where in the West, um, these, these, uh, these bodies could also be under threat for their legitimacy? Um, the other thing uh, is I do want to put on, there was a question in the chat about data localization. And um, this is another kind of question of, we were in a, in a period of expanding openness in standards and, and standard setting. And are, is that now in a retrenchment where for other reasons, uh, national security, I think is one of the main drivers that people are rethinking, you know, should openness in digital spaces be as open as they have been? And the two questions kind of go together in some ways. And uh, maybe I'll start this time with Laura. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, I think that there is a, a resurgence of proprietary enclosure happening in, in many areas. You know, I would agree with the assumption in that question and, and it's related to what I just said about uh, the heterogeneity of the digital space and how some areas are, you know, you're, you would favor openness more than others. You brought up the disinformation area. And, you know, what I would say about that related to this discussion is that there's an overemphasis on the content platforms in dealing with this when a lot of the most powerful mechanisms of control that either decide to take something down or to amplify, replicate, and, uh, you know, accelerate its spread. It's actually beneath the level of content intermediaries like cloud computing, like DNS uh, service providers, and you know things that many people have never heard of. They're making these decisions. I guess the, the most high profile example of that is when Amazon Web Services deplatformed Parler uh, for obvious reasons that you know, you're, you're certainly aware of that example. Um, so that's, um, is that multi-stakeholder governance? No. I would say that that's not at the at that level of content governance. I would not call that multi-stakeholder governance. I would call that private governance. And the reason for that is because the First Amendment protects a lot of speech that uh, these companies make a decision through their terms of service and their practices, imperfectly, albeit, to deal with things that are lawful, but that are objectionable. So that's an example of private governance. But when you use the term multi-stakeholder governance. That is a term that applies to the entire ecosystem of policy around the digital system. And in some cases, that means that governments are monolithic um, points of power in certain areas. So for example, the GDPR is a point of power that um, is a strong privacy protection. I wouldn't call that multi-stakeholder governance either. But that's an example of a government that has some authority. And then in still others, like ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, you have a jumble of different actors within the institution making decisions about trademark, you know, who, who gets domain names, how IP addresses are spread around the world. And so if you put all of that together, that is what's called uh, the multi-stakeholder model. Um, is it under threat? Um, it always has been under threat. It's simplified in discussions. It's a messy area. Joe Nye calls it a regime complex. Many different institutions, some are led by governments, some are exclusively governments, some are exclusively private sector actors, some are true multi-stakeholder organizations. And I would actually put the Internet Engineering T Task Force closer to that latter camp. Thank you. So this, this is a fascinating area because it raises a very important question over what exactly are the, who exactly are the makers of standards and then what, by what right do they make these standards? And so this also then gets into normative questions over who should, and Laura alluded to this in this uh, alphabet soup of private sector, 
government, and then multilateral non-governmental organizations that are involved in standardization. The big problem is, especially when it comes from my area of research to the international standards, those two which become binding, what types of standards are normatively to be accepted? Is it multi-stakeholder because it's multiple governments and therefore the interests of many states are represented? Or is it multi-stakeholder because it is open to companies? But then by that, it becomes biased because companies with greater resources gain greater influence. So there's an imperfect and a market ver ver variation as well. And then similarly, even within a working group within these levels, your ability to contribute technology is in some ways predicated on the resource base that you bring in. So even individual level participation in the setting of standards in the interest of creating the most open, uniform, fair, and by consensus accepted principles also is an imperfect system. So the problem I think for the idea of a multi-stakeholder governance model that is effective at guaranteeing whether it's human rights or the economic outcomes that we desire, the problem with this is that fundamentally the systems are not designed for fairness of distribution. They're designed to create standards. Whether or not they end up being fair also then becomes a question of fair to whom. So it's sort of a non-answer, but what I would say is it's highly uh, complicated. Okay, I saw a question which actually will be related. How are international standards created? And the answer is yes. They are created by governments and organizations such as the ITU. They are created by non-governmental organizations like the IEEE. They're created by intergovernmental organizations like the ISO. So many of these different organizations create a standard which then under vague WTO rules, once it is utilized on an international basis or adopted by one of these global bodies, becomes an international standard and therefore at least technically becomes binding. Great, um, so we only have like one minute left. So I don't know if Laura, if you wanted to have a, a last follow-up to that point uh, or if you have a final, a final word and then I think we'll need to wrap it up. I think a, a, a final word might come from uh, Janet Abate in Inventing the Internet, which was written uh, in 1999, that protocols are politics by other means. Great. Um, I think that's a great place to, to end the conversation. I want to first um, thank our speakers for joining us today. Uh, I want to thank all of our participants who've come over the, the, the past year to the different uh, meetings. And I would also encourage everybody who was not able to attend a previous conversation, you can find them on our website and our YouTube channel at the Mortara Center uh, to hear a whole host of conversations from about AI, uh, cybersecurity, digital repression, and the like. Um, so thanks again for joining us and we will uh, see everybody soon in the next installment of the DESK uh, initiative. Thanks again. Oh, and I should also thank the Board of Regents uh, and the Open Society Foundation who helped support this project financially. Thanks again, everybody.